Bless you, my brothers. It is a joy and a privilege to be greeting you from our online services. You know, though I would very much would have hoped to have done this in person, I, I still give thanks to God that we can interact with one another, even, even though we are distant uh, from one another, geographically speaking. Um, at least we are still able to interact with one another through uh, the internet, through these, these uh, online services that we have to put in play now. Um, this was something unconceivable. This was something that we, we obviously didn't prepare for. And this isn't just us. This is on a global scale. But nevertheless, this isn't uh, a time for us to be in fear or in doubt or in confusion or anything like that. We, we have our hope. We have a, a God who's still sovereign. I want to begin by reminding you guys, firstly, that God is the one who's still on the throne. This doesn't throw anything out of the window. God is in control. God is sovereign and, and he is king of all things. And beyond that as well, not only do we have a hope in the fact that God is still on his throne, but also that you and I, though, though we may be distant, though we may be engaging through these online services, the, the fact is that though we may be somewhat apart physically, we're united in Christ. And that's something that, that is so wonderful because I'm reminded of Paul when Paul says to us in Scripture that nothing can separate us from Christ, you know, from His love. And I love that because that I want to make emphasis on the word there, us. It's a small word that sometimes goes unnoticed, but he, he says that all of us, we are united not by race, not by gender, not by occupation or even geography. We are united by one thing, one common denominator that uh, embraces all of us, and that's the love of Christ. And so I want to begin by reminding you that God is sovereign and that God loves you. Um, so we are united. We are united through Christ. We have the hope that we have. We share this hope together. This is not just my hope. It is our hope. It is you and I's. And so Having said that, though, this would be a good time to obviously address the fact that we are going through some uncertain times. No doubt these times are, may spur up within our hearts some sort of uh, maybe some anxiety, some somewhat um, fear maybe because as human beings, we fear the unknown. Like I said, this is something that we weren't ready for. We weren't expecting it. Um, we may not know, however, uh, what may lie tomorrow, what the next year may bring us, what a month's time will bring us. But I just want to remind you guys that that this is the case since day one. As believers, we have always lived with that, with that uncertainty of what tomorrow would bring. Because we as believers confess that, you know, that tomorrow is not promised to us. All we can really do is, is just do what we're called to do now. And that's praise God, love God, no matter what circumstance we may be going through. You know, our hope has never been in a better tomorrow. I know a lot of people, um, you know, hope that tomorrow is going to bring uh, bring us new joys or whatever. But our hope has never been in a better tomorrow. Our hope has never been in a new, in a prosperous new year. You know, at the end of the year, we always say, you know, we, we wish you a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. That, that seems to be the slogan at the end of each year. But our hope has never been on a prosperous new year or a prosperous financial year even. We are not of those who trust in ourselves that, that you know, we hope that we we can bring a change for tomorrow by what we do. No, we, we've always been as Christians instructed to serve our Lord today. And then whatever God does with what we do today, let it be for His glory. We always leave tomorrow in His hands. You know, for our hope is not in a better tomorrow. Our hope is not in a, in a better new year. Our hope is always been and always will be in the Lord. And this is the message for you today. And if I could kind of reform this, this statement that, that God is our hope, maybe I can change it into a question and make this the title of the message. In whom have you placed your hope? Because that's primarily the question that I want to press on your hearts today. Like I said, this would undoubtedly bring some some. A sense of uncomfortability. It's going to bring us out into uh, or outside of our comfort zones. You know, we've had our routine for many years. We've had all these things that we've relied upon, but now maybe those things are uncertain. Now, now those things 
may lay or, or, or rest on uncertain ground, on shaky ground. But again, I want to remind you that that has been the reality since the beginning. You know, I want you. I want to remind you that that the hope that we've always had had been the same. It has not changed. It has. It has always been God. And so today, I want to kind of walk through you th- through the Book of Romans, in particular, three passages from the Book of Romans that I believe will encourage you. It speaks on on hope and what hope is that we as believers have, and. Um, at the end of these three passages that we get to meditate today, I, I want to end also with uh, the words, not of, of uh, some renowned prophet, words not from some, some you know, wise theologian or um, words from, I don't know, whatever, right? I want to end with the words that I, I have no doubt will bring courage and, and hope and strength to you because they are not words of men. They are direct words of the Lord that I believe still have great impact and great uh, encouragement in those words. So I'll end with the words of our Lord and Savior. So to begin with, I want us to open up our Bibles. If you are if you're here watching online, um, please, I want to encourage you guys to pick up your Bibles, especially now to go through the word. You know, you're going to find uh, encouragement, promises, and a reminder of how great our God is by by reading His Word. So, with that in mind, uh, please, if you would join me in in reading from Romans chapter five, and we're going to be reading verses uh, three to five to begin with, and then we'll, we'll you know uh, move on to the next two portions that I have have prepared for for us this time together. So the Word of God says this: Romans chapter five, verse three to five says this. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And we'll leave it there. Hope does not put us to shame, it says. Hope does not put us to shame. What what does this mean? What does this mean? This uh, that that doesn't put us to shame. Well, the word there for shame it means to blush. It means to be humiliated. And I'm sure we've all experienced that sensation where you know maybe you felt the 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 blood um, just rush to your face and you immediately feel that you've you're blushing. You've gone red in the face. You know. That's the idea that we see here in this in this passage where it's talking about us being put to shame, that we as believers, the implication is that we as believers, those who are given this hope, will not have to hang their heads in shame, will not have to put their heads down low in fear and in trembling of what may come. You know, the hope that is deposited in us is a hope that raises our weary heads. You know, it's a hope that... that doesn't give us reason to throw in the towel. It doesn't give us reason to give up. You know, once you have hope, it means that you are uh, uh, kept, you are firm, you know, you persevere, you endure, you, you put one foot in front of the other because of this hope that you have, that you've received. You know, what hope is, if I could, you know, give you an analogy or an example of some form, some, some thought, um, here, hope is the gift of knowing how the story will end. That's a hope. You know, a story that, that every story has an ending, right? And so when you know the, the ending and how things are going to end, it, it kind of puts you at ease a bit. And the truth is that we as believers, the story for all believers is that it ends in victory for us. We don't have some you know, flimsy story where, where anything goes or we, we are uncertain. No, we have the word of God that is clear that we are victorious in Christ because of what he has done for us. You know, but it, it may seem conflicting somewhat to us in, in the fact that, you know, this, this hope, this hope's certainty of not being uh, put to shame is kind of contrasted by what also what Paul also says about the Christian believer and our life and the things that we will go through because he says that we won't be put to shame but at the same time that's contrasted against this statement that Paul makes that we as believers will face sufferings 
will face sufferings. That's that's unusual. This is this seems almost contradictive because we assume that a victorious life is a life of no troubles. But let me ask you something, and hopefully this kind of clarifies this. How are you able to know of victory if you have not yet suffered? Have not had to endure, hadn't, hadn't to persevere or struggle. You know, we can only know of victory after we endure the sufferings and the toils and the setbacks of pain and of struggling. But we as believers, you know, we are not bound to this suffering. We are, we are not, uh, const- uh, I guess, constrained by, by suffering. That, that means that we are not limited by it, that that's not all that we are, we may go through it, but the, the point of a believer is that whatever suffering we, we go through, we go through it. We don't remain there. In fact, quite the opposite. We go through it with a purpose, and that's what Paul is trying to indicate to us here, that, that we as believers go through it so that it is through this that we are made. We are formed, as it will, as a... As a, as a as a, as a means through which we, it's as though God carries us through this trial in order to develop the character of a victor, right? In order to develop the character of Christ within us. It is through the suffering that he puts us through that out comes this strong, you know, courageous believer. It is because we go through these sufferings. You know, this is most evident, obviously, in the one we call our victor, our forerunner. That is Jesus. He is our example, the one who suffered and endured and was put to shame, right? Was not put to shame because he he rose from the dead three days later. He became our hope in which we turn to in times of suffering. You know, that is time, you know, that, that these things that we go through, these are just times that we go through. It is but a time, it is but a moment. But what is a moment or a time or a period compared to eternity where our true victory lies? Because that is where it lies. It is in eternity. We may suffer temporarily, but it is just for a moment. We may be enduring. We may be just hanging on right now. But brothers, I want to remind you that this is just temporary. It is not eternal. What awaits for you in eternity is victory. It is joy. It is glory. You know, there's one final thing that I wish to kind of point out to you in regards to this portion. And it is this, that the hope that we are given, it is given because of love and through the Holy Spirit. It is because of love and through the Holy Spirit. This is so encouraging because we have this hope. This is a hope that is given to us because God loves us. I want to kind of break this down just heaps quickly. I don't want to reduce this to something so simplistic as as this, but it it still stands true. The saying still uh, stands true. Saying that, you know, that we, it is through the Spirit that we receive this. You know, it is through the indwelling of the Spirit of God that we have been given these things, these hopes, these blessings that we've just read in Romans. You know, the Spirit of God does not reside in us idly. Like He's not just in us doing nothing, kicking back, right? He's not bludging. You know, when when the Spirit of God comes into us, He is active. He works in us. He's drawing us back to the Word of God, reminding us of the word of, uh, of the work of Christ, which empowers us to live our lives today, despite our circumstances, despite the struggles that we're going through. You know, it is because the Holy Spirit is in us. It's working in us, engaging us, drawing us back to the Word that we are empowered, that we are able to go through and endure. So Paul tells us that it is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we endure, that hope arises. It is because of the Holy Spirit that these things happen and does not put us to shame. You know, that that, that whatever circumstance we are going through, it won't be for our shame. It won't end there. It is because of the Holy Spirit, Paul tells us. So if we endure, 
If we persevere, it is because of the Holy Spirit of God working in us, stirring us up to hope. But I don't want to miss this vital work of the Holy Spirit in us. Not only does He cause us to endure, not only does He build character through the sufferings that we have to go through, but also, and this is what is so amazing, but also there is rejoicing. Did you see that? That that's what Paul says in that passage. There is rejoicing that we rejoice in suffering. Now, our, our logical minds tend to sway into confusion at this point. But try, don't let your minds kind of lead you in that way or lead you down that path of, you know, this is inconceivable. Because the truth of the matter is, it seems illogical that we would suffer and then be happy because we suffered. But again... I want to remind you that this is not a work that comes from within ourselves. This is not a work that, that we spur up from ourselves. This doesn't come from us. Again, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside you. So if you rejoice, so you can rejoice during these times, know that this isn't because you are strong. This isn't because you are great. You are some you know, you, you've bought into a, a positive mentality. No, Paul says it is not because of you, but rather because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. And so, my brothers, do you have the Spirit of God? Because if you do, He's going to be reminding you of the Word. He's going to be giving you courage. He's going to be putting that joy inside you. You don't have to do this. You don't have to build yourself up into that. We are not manufacturing hope or joy in suffering. It is a work of God through the indwelling Holy Spirit. So again, I ask you, in whom have you placed your hope? Because if you have the Spirit of God living in you, you will rejoice. Despite circumstance, despite turmoil, despite these ups and downs, despite these uncertain times, you will rejoice because your hope does not come from the circumstance, does not come from you know, a sense of security, does not come from the increasing bank account. It comes from somewhere else. So in whom have you placed your hope? Let's read now Romans, if you could keep it in Romans chapter 8 this time. And we'll read verses 24 and 25. Romans 8, 24 and 25. Paul says this, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Brothers, this is so encouraging. This hope is a hope that is beyond this world. It is a hope that transcends this world because it does not come from this world. For such a long time, we may have been so accustomed, you know, right? We, we may have been confessing a hope in God for, for, for most of our lives, you know, but we may have been confessing that we've believed in God, but functionally and living this, this confession out in, may not have been as genuine as we had, or had confessed. Maybe our hope was really in this world. We may have rested easily, at times slept like babies because, you know, of our financial investments or our steady incomes or our ever-growing savings account. You know, our aspirations for a future may have stemmed from within this world, you know, in our, in our health, in our ability to survive, in our strength. You know, as long as I have breath in our lungs, I'm going to, you know, do this or accomplish that. You know, we, we set ourselves goals and we set ourselves these, these things in mind where we, we want to go and achieve for ourselves. But scripture reminds us that our hope does not reside in this world. It does not reside in ourselves. It does not reside in the dreams or the goals that we may have set for ourselves. Our, our hope resides in God alone. 
Our, our investment is not here in this passing world, but rather it is with God and God alone because He is eternal. Everything else passes, it fades away. You know, there are many people who have, may have placed their hope in many things. And yet all of them will fail you. Every single one of these things that you've placed your hope in outside of God will fail you. And I want to tell you this, remind you of this, that if you've placed your hope in anything other than God, then this is nothing short of idolatry. The word of God says, I am Yahweh and besides me, there is no savior. So to place our hope in money is to commit idolatry. You cannot serve two masters, the Lord says. I'm sure you all remember this. You cannot serve both God and money. But how easy is it for us to do this, to fall in the trap of, of comfort, the comfort that money may bring? And why is that? It is because we can see it, we can touch it, we can use it to better position ourselves. No doubt, brothers and sisters, money is useful, even, dare I say, necessary for us in this world. But it is not a savior. You know, many turn to it as though money is the answer to King David's question in Psalms 121, where he says, from where does my help come from? And David answers his own question by saying, my help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. Brothers, is this where you've placed your hope in? In Yahweh, in God, just as David did. Can you cry out just as David cried out in this psalm, from where does my hope come from? My hope comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. You see, the God that we serve is the God who is invisible to us, to the naked eye. He is the invisible God who made everything that is visible to us. And that is why Paul can say that hope that is seen is not hope at all. For if hope is truly in what we can see, then there is no hope for it's already here. You don't need to wait. You don't need to w wait around for it. You could just go get it. You can just go run out and go get it because if you think that hope is something visible that you can attain, then you can just go out and well, you can go out and go get that. But hope is immaterial. You can't just go out and get it. You can't make it. You can't manufacture it. If hope is, is money, then what stops you from getting more of it? If truly your hope has been in finance, then what, what's stopping you from getting more? What, what, what happens when, when money no longer can get you what you need, though? Was hope really in money? If hope was in what we could see, then there is no need, as Paul says, to wait. But hope is not in what is seen because hope is not an object. It's a person. Hope is waited on because you cannot go out and get it. You can't go and get him. He must come to you. So again, I ask you, in whom or in what have you placed your hope? Have you placed your hope in God? Then await for Him. He won't take long. He will come. He is your God. He is your hope. Many people may look at the ancient Israelites in terms of the way they, uh, I guess, were so inclined towards idolatry, you know, when they wanted to, uh, get more success in their crop, you know, they would be so inclined to worship other gods, you know. And, and I want to tell you that, you know, this is not a symptom of the ancient society that we know as the Israelites in the Old Testament. This is a condition of all humanity, including myself and yourself. We are not exempt from that temptation of seeking refuge in anything other than our God. Many find comfort in certain leaders of nations whom 
we endorse and we say that they're doing a great job with this fight against the coronavirus as though our hope is in man. There is only one in whom we must depend upon and that is God, my brothers. He is the one that establishes leaders and places them over us. So to whom shall you place your hope in? To whom shall you pray for wisdom? Of whom do you give praise to? To man and say, wow, what a great job is this prime minister, this president doing, this king. Or do you give all glory to God? On whom have you placed your hope in? Brothers, our God is an invisible God and it is in him that we must await. It is comforting to wait upon what we do not see. That is God. Because in our experience with this world and our lives, I'm sure, you know, with all that we can see, all that we can touch, all that we we can experience here in this earth, I'm sure that you can agree with me that this has been true in all of our experience, that everything that we can touch, everything that we can see with our physical eyes and touch with our, with our hands are things that eventually depart from us. Our money that we, we may pile up, you know, the money that we see come in, we have seen it go from us. As quick as it comes is as quick, quick as it goes to never return to us again. And so we need to get more of it. Our friends whom we thought would be there forever may have left us at one stage. We may have been, you know, b- building build, uh, a massive construction or a building and we've even seen those Buildings that seem impenetrable crumble before our eyes. Even our loved ones, we, we have seen them depart from this world. All that we see eventually goes. But this is not the case with God, whom we can not see. And Paul tells us that we must await on Him, because He is our hope and He is coming. A hope that never leaves us. So again, I ask you, in whom have you placed your hope? In whom have you placed your hope? Because it is only God that can give us this hope, this certainty. Our final passage for, for today is in, in Romans 12, as we meditate upon this, um, this, this hope that we have. Romans 12, verse 12, and we'll, we'll finish up with this. Uh, we'll finish up with the words of the Lord, as I said. But this will be our final thought. It says here, Romans 12, verse 12, it says, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Brothers, my final thoughts are these. If hope is not a person, then to rejoice in hope would be blasphemous and idolatrous. But hope is a person and it is our God. Hope is is God. That is who our hope is. And that is why we are instructed to not only be patient and await Him, but to pray constantly to Him. Why? Because our hope is God. Our hope has ears to listen. Praise God. Amen. And He is mighty. He has mighty hands to save us. Our hope is not something material, something that we can see. It's not a financial, uh, uh, I guess, position or circumstance. Our hope is a person who hears our prayers. Our hope is not some abstract ideal or concept. It is a person and He lives. Not only is this hope, open to hearing from us constantly. But what a great God we serve, amen. But this reminds us of something. The fact that we are instructed to constantly pray reveals to us our constant need to pray to Him. God doesn't just encourage us to pray to Him because, you know, He needs us to know. You know, many, many have foolishly taught that we pray and ask or demand from Him because if we do or don't do, then God can't work in us. No, that's, that's foolishness. It's not we, we pray to God so that God can do things for us. No, we pray to God because we need Him. Many teach that, you know, God needs permission from us to act. No, He is God. He is sovereign. 
We do not grant him permission or anything like that. No, the reason why he calls us to pray constantly is because we constantly need him. And we fall back because we always tend to fall back into our old habits of trusting in what we see. Trusting back into our, well, in our circumstances, in our fi- financial position, in our business, in our bank accounts, in our health in what we have, in what we possess. But that's not where hope is. That's why Paul says hope is in what you can't see because of the things that you can see, brothers, you know that they will go, go away. Our hope is in God. We have tendencies to always go back to our old habits, to go back to building that golden calf, right? Because we, we think if we do something, then we're going to be prosperous, But everything that we have is because of God. And so he calls us, be constant in prayer, my brothers. I've began by encouraging you to remind you to read your Bible consistently. I also want to encourage you to pray consistently as well. Not only for yourselves and for your families, but for all of us. And not only for, you know, requests and asking God to grant us this or grant us that, but to express our gratitude. Because for as long as we are here, we have reason to be grateful. Everything that we have, brothers, it is given to us. My encouragement to you, my brothers, is this. Rejoice in the Lord who is our hope. Be patient in the Lord who is our hope. And be constant in prayer to our Lord who is our hope. And to this message... I see no better way, like I said, than to hear from our Lord. And so with that in mind, I want to close up by reading to you the words of our Lord, these very famous words, and I'm sure you've all read it. It comes from Matthew. Word of God says this, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Those are the words of the Lord, my brothers. And I pray and trust that these words will be uh, an encouragement to you because they are not my words. They are not my thoughts. They are not my concepts. This is the word. This is his promise. We have a hope in God because our hope is not something physical. It's not something we can see. It's not something we can chase. The hope that we have is that we get to await him because he will come. He is here. We get to rejoice because His Spirit dwells in us, even in the midst of this confusing times. But we have a hope. O Lord, for what do I await? My hope is in You, says David, Psalms 39.7. So brothers, that's my encouragement to you. And I want to just bow our heads in prayer as we finish up. Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your message. Father, we just pray that You help us uh, to remind ourselves, to, to be reminded 